Welcome back to Recap. I'm QQ and my friend Johnny D is joining me to produce the videos. Let's get right to it, shall we? I have some great news on the ethics and games journalism front. More dig results came out courtesy of Boogie Pop Robin. Some of them contain more dirt on Kara Ellison. Do you remember Ellison from our last video? Yet another conflict of interest in her past was found, this time with indie game dev Nina Freeman. Basically, there are some articles on Rock Paper Shotgun and Kotaku that Ellison wrote, without disclosing that they had some kind of personal relationship where they hung out together, cared deeply for each other, and even took Instagram selfies together. While one of the articles on Rock Paper Shotgun did disclose that they were living together, the other Rock Paper Shotgun article and the Kotaku article did not disclose any details about their relationship. So yet another possible conflict of interest. This is bad news. Where's that great news that I promised you? Well, for quite a while, Kara Ellison was commissioned to write a repeating column for Rock Paper Shotgun called S.exe? S.sexy? Something like that. The last issue of the column that came out on April 24th contain this cancellation notice in the footer. I'll quote the interesting parts. This is the last s.exe. I'm taking a break from writing about video games to do other things to video games. And quote, love you too, rock, paper, shotgun. I'll miss you. Hmm, taking a break from writing about video games? She'll miss writing for rock, paper, shotgun? I guess freelancers don't get fired. They just don't get hired again. Some of her tweets preceding this cancellation give us some insight into what she was thinking. This is just my interpretation, but I find it interesting. We make bonds because we can't survive without them, and then are hung out to dry on them, and then have no income. Let me translate that. Boo hoo, I was caught behaving inappropriately with the subjects of my writing, and now no one will pay me to write for them anymore. Or how about this one? Marginalized people should be offered salaried jobs instead of piecework to provide content for gaps. I feel pretty strongly about this. Here's my translation. The patriarchy did this to me, and I'm owed restitution. She might need to get her blood pressure checked out after that much salt intake. So another one bites the dust. But I bet she'll pop up again. She's part of the in-group of that tiny chunk of the indie community that gets and gives all the press attention. Stay vigilant and keep your eyes open. That's not all that turned up. Boogie Pop Robin is a digging machine. Another conflict of interest was found last week. Props to Jasperge107. This time, between the subject, Terry Kavana, creator of VVVVVV and Super Hexagon, and the journalist, Chris Priestman, who writes for Killscreen and others. Priestman wrote four articles on Terry in Pocket Gamer, Warp Door, and Killscreen, this one being the most recent. The problem is that Terry gives money to Priestman on Patreon and has been doing so since February of 2014. That's well before any of these articles were written. Wait, wait, go back up a little. That face is familiar. I guess that this is what they mean when they say games journalism and indie games are incestuous, eh? Every time I hear someone say something about how, of course everyone knows everyone else in gaming, it's a small industry. I mean, didn't a certain indie dev claim to know every other woman out there? Yeah, it's such a tiny industry, such a tiny multi-billion dollar industry. Saying that gaming is tiny is not reality, it's just how they perceive reality. The issue here is that there's a very small, very tight-knit in-group of indie devs that are quite hostile to the out-group, to the point where they reject their humanity or sometimes their existence. This wouldn't be a huge problem if it wasn't for the games journalists joining in on the circle jerk. Now that's just fucked up. So I have to give that disclosure again. It's not enough to give it in one thing you make and not in another. And it's really incredibly easy to disclose. <clears throat> I paid 25 bucks to the Honey Badger Brigade to help them get a booth at the Calgary Expo. Wow, that didn't hurt at all. That was downright easy. Now you, the viewer, are aware that my coverage of this incident is likely to be biased in favor of the Brigade. Isn't it nice to know the biases of an author? And I'm just a dude with a tiny YouTube channel. Anyway, the Brigade had the police called on them last week. Some of their fans who were counting on them to be at the expo had come a long way and had paid good money to meet with them. Since they'd been kicked out on Saturday the 18th and Sunday the 19th, they met in a park near the event so that these fans would have an opportunity to meet them. Sadly, the expo became concerned that these people dangerously engaging in their right to speak freely with each other in a public place might be plotting to re-enter the convention, and they called the police. There is video of this incident, the audio is low quality, but it clearly confirms that this happened. I think we can all agree that calling the police on someone for bogus reasons is a scummy tactic. 
to round off this video just for laughs, the movie Game Loading Rise of the Indies was released. It featured a lot of familiar faces. I don't have any desire to pay money for this thing or to see it, but thankfully someone made a handy user guide to it and it features some very familiar faces. Christine Love, that indie dev again, Rami, Nina Freeman, and Ben Kuchera? Wait, why is that blight on the face of games journalism involved in a movie about indie games? Anyway, I'm not here to talk about the contents of the movie. I haven't seen it, so I can't give a fair assessment. What I'm here to talk about is the reaction to it, because I think it's a very positive sign. A sign of an attitude shift in the general gaming populace. The movie was sold on Steam, a distribution platform ran by Valve, as a pay-for-streaming model. The first sign that something was up was the tags. What kind of perception must Steam users have of the indie click if they are choosing tags like these? Villain protagonist? Alternate history? Dystopian? My first reaction was to collapse in a fit of giggles, but keep these tags in mind for now. Another thing that was interesting about this movie release was a user by the name of Impact Hound decided to use the Steam's user guide creation feature to make a guide to all the people featured in the film. It's written very cleverly, giving background information on everyone featured, but it focuses on calling out anyone who is involved in unethical behavior. The guide does not mention Gamergate, but it echoes a lot of Gamergate's concerns with the indie click. This guide currently sits at a 5 star user rating. The top rated reviews for the film are all thumbs down, even though its cumulative score currently stands as mostly positive. Some of the top reviews were complaining about how it was streaming only. But the reviews complaining about the content of the movie? Well, let me read some excerpts. Impact Hound writes, Game Loading is a very frenetic, hard to watch documentary about a specific clique of game developers that identify as indie, but are actually very interconnected with one another. Ebola Chan noticed that the movie was about, quote, games made on a train ride by hipsters who can freely afford to globetrot while masquerading as poor people who are just scraping by. They also mention how it's odd that Ben Kachera is in there, but with his, quote, lackluster and storied career. Kinderhund writes that it's meant for the kind of audience that would throw and splatter a bucket of off-branded rainbow paint on someone's porch without their consent and call it art. See what I'm getting at? Let me state my interpretation plainly. You so-called devs in the indie click, you broke it. Your bad behavior, your refusal to own up to it, your strict rules for acceptable politics for in-group membership, your smearing of the out-group as hate-filled misogynists and racists, and your insistence that the out-group is uncultured, Gamergate noticed. But core gamers indifferent to Gamergate noticed as well. Everyone sees the click now. Very few gamers find the people within the click very likable. They're starting to wake up and realize that so-called indie gaming is full of Phil Fishes, and that gaming journalism is too. It's got developers like Mark Kern asking if the word indie is tainted now. This is an important thing that needed to happen in my opinion. The tiny click of devs and journalists who keep the indie scene the small incestuous blob that it is today, they need to be noticed, they need to be called out. Their transgressions need to be laid bare for all to see. So how do you fix gaming? Well, this is a matter of opinion. I say toss them all out. The gaming industry doesn't need a single one of these click members, whether they are devs or journalists. If they want the respect of gamers again, well, apologies are in order. And they'll need to measurably reform themselves to demonstrate that they're busting up the click. Until then, we need to keep doing what we demonstrated here. Whenever they show their face, just tell the truth about them. Sociology books will probably not be kind to Gamergate, but that doesn't matter. Internet culture will remember it forever. Have you searched YouTube lately? Any event that Gamergate participants are interested in has its video results dominated by the pro Gamergate perspective. In my opinion, this is because it's much easier to get on a mic and tell the truth than it is to carefully fabricate lies and propaganda to try and keep the narrative straight. So that's all I have time for in this recap. David Pacman did some more video interviews and there was a lot of Twitter drama that I won't bring up. You'll have to learn about that on your own. Like, share, and subscribe and I'll see you again next time. Ciao!